uh, about the EU Next Generation Initiative and the other ways to get your NixOS project funded for, from uh, Armin. All right, thank you. So can you hear me? All fine? Okay, good. So my name is Armin. Uh, as some of you might have noticed, I'm probably the only person here not using NixOS. It's actually Fedora. So while we were, so yeah, you can boo me, you can throw things at me, but only chocolate, please. Um, so while, when we were driving here to, uh, to this conference, Rob just kept saying like, you know, just give me your laptop. I will just install NixOS right now. And I said, just keep your eyes on the road, okay? All right. So um, let's talk about money, that mean, mean green. So and how you can get paid for working on an open source uh, project, including Nix and NixOS. So Samuel already talked a little bit about what he did, and I'm going to explain a little bit more about the specifics to, uh, together with Jos here from NLNet. So uh, this is an interactive talk, so feel free to ask questions. On the other end, I've got quite a few slides, so you might want to ask them at the end. So a little bit of a poll. How many of you are currently uh, working getting paid to work on open source software. So there's one. That's, uh, so how many of you would like to get paid for it? So then this talk is mostly for you. So next generation internet. Basically this is something, in, uh, a program in the Horizon 2020 program, a research program from the EU. And um, it is about making a more human internet. So. Uh, that's the blurb that I got from their website, so I'm not going to read it. But basically, you have to see it as reimagining and re-engineering the internet. So currently, the internet, as we know it, is uh, it has very much has a Silicon Valley imprint. Basically, it's DNA. There's there's a, a lot of it just screams Silicon Valley. On the other hand, there is also a lot of stuff going on in other parts of the world to create their own internet. So think of what's happening in China, but also in India. If you're following a little bit of what's happening with the internet in India, it can get quite scary, so what their government is trying to do. So the EU, even though it can be considered kind of big and a moloch at, at times, they want to re-engineer the internet, make it more humane, and to get the val core values uh, like democracy, um, diversity, and so on, ingrained into into the internet to make it actually make it a better internet. I think I that kind of so Jos is agreeing. So one sub project of that is NGI Zero, which I will be talking about today. So NGI Zero, first of all, it's uh, a consortium with quite a few organizations involved there. I'm not going to run through all of them, but the most important ones, of course, you see there, NixOS Foundation. That's us. Yay and NLNet Foundation and a whole bunch of others where uh, people are, oh, I thought I had it. Actually, I should have had that picture. Um, so there are quite a, quite a few organizations involved, things like translations, secure software, packaging, uh, accessibility, you name it. So there are a whole bunch of uh, organizations involved in the NGI Zero project. Now we're going to, all right. So, but before I can explain what we actually do, I need to talk to you a little bit about what a normal grant procedure in the EU looks like. So the normal process to get funds in the Horizon 2020 program or any EU program for that matter is basically like this. You have to form a consortium of at least three organizations from various countries or partners from the right parts of Europe. So you get one from North Europe, you get one from the garlic countries, and one from the cabbage countries, and then you're usually fine. So, and so from all geographically nice, uh, so the, the right parts, you uh, send in a proposal, then you do stuff for a few years, and then you basically throw something over the wall and you get paid. So, and then sometimes it doesn't even compile or even work, or do what it was supposed to, to do. So this is a very process heavy thing. It's not very suitable for open source because most of us, we like to work in a much more agile way. So you know, do small projects, fast releases, uh, 
work on tiny things and then just move on to the next interesting thing because that's how we work. Uh, but this process is not for us. It's for the big corporations. It's uh, the big telcos, the big uh, industrial conglomerates who actually have whole departments just writing proposals to get money out of the EU. And um, if you're actually looked at doing one of those proposals, I did, it's, it's, it's horrible. It doesn't work for us. I need to get, I need to hire something like two or three people to actually do that stuff and then have them on a payroll. Of course I will get it reimbursed, but it's a lot of overhead. This is totally not suited for SMEs or open source developers. And it's also not helping the public because you get something that might not even work. But you know, it fits the proposal. They, can, they, they got money for it, so it should be good, right? So basically a lot of this money is not working for us. And that is something uh, that should change. So NLNet Foundation, uh, basically they organized a, uh, a consortium and they try to see like, okay, maybe we can do something that we've already done for the last 20 years. So NLNet Foundation is a Dutch nonprofit. They trace their history back to the very first internet provider in the Netherlands, so in 1982. That's before most of you were born. So, um, and then they sold their provider off to UUNet, and later Verizon. They got a bunch of money, they formed a nonprofit, and since 1997, so before some of you were born, they've been handing out uh, grants to open source development. So um, basically what they are doing is a very lightweight approach. A developer says like, I've got this great idea, sends in a proposal, and LNET looks at it and thinks like, you know, if you can do this stuff, then we are willing to make a donation to you. And it's super lightweight, developer starts working, delivers, and then there is a payout after completion of the milestones. And that's just the complete opposite of how the normal EU grants uh, work. And this, is, uh, this has been working for a very long time, so more than 20 years they've, uh, they've sponsored things like DNSSEC, uh, many other things that I don't even remember. There's a whole list on the website. There's a lot of stuff that they've, they've done. So in the background they've been doing a lot of very good stuff. And also what's important, they're a registered charity in the Netherlands, and in, at least in the Netherlands and also in some of the uh, countries you can actually get it and get, because it's a donation from a charity, you don't pay taxes, which can be nice. So NLNet wanted to bring this lightweight process to the Horizon 2020 program. So they found, they formed the NGI Zero Consortium and uh, basically then they uh, sent in proposals to the EU and then they were awarded 11.2 million euro to spend on uh, open source development, which is pretty cool. So, and, and then uh, for two themes, one of them is search and discovery, which is basically unlocking all kinds of data, uh, making sure that people can uh, discover their data in some way. So think search engines, IOT, search, whatever. Anything search and discovery related. And then also privacy enhancing technology. So think security. And the EU is also carefully paying attention to see how this, uh, how this will work because they know that, well, I think that they secretly know that their normal grant process doesn't really work. It doesn't really work for the people in the EU. So they think like, okay, how can we change it? Well, okay, so it, the grant program works for some people in the EU, but not the vast majority. So they think like, okay, well, how can we make it work for everyone? So they're uh, paying attention and seeing how things will work out and then maybe if it's successful, they might expand this and that would be good for all of us. So, um, Jos told me that around, so uh, as of today, we're, we've been running this for, what, what, 10 months? One year? And so a bit less than one year and so far, four mil million euro has been allocated for development in these two domains for about 100 120 projects. And what is interesting is that 95% of the grant seekers, they've never participated in any of the grant programs of the EU before. So at, le or at least in the Horizon 2020. So they are now reaching a completely new 
group of people that are in need of a grant but couldn't get it or didn't want uh, didn't know how to get it or thought it was way too much overhead so that's a very good thing so already shown that one so and then of course the the, the role of NixOS in this consortium so and now at foundation they are big fans of NixOS we have a history going back a long time even before NixOS started because the current director of technology of Enelnet Foundation was actually uh, working for the Dutch Academy of Sciences and he got uh, so and he was the person who basically um, read Ilko's original proposal and signed off on it <laughs> so it is even um, going back from way before there was NixOS and way before he was working for Enelnet Foundation so there's a very long history which is which is cool. So and they they really like uh, NixOS. They think it's fantastic, and of course it is. And they are convinced that things like um, deployment of software, then to make it easy, would be very essential to make this pro uh, project work. Because normally they would get something like, yeah, you know, to run this software, you need to uh, run this specific version of Ubuntu with these packages and maybe that patch or another component you need to have SUSE with uh, these packages installed and that out of tree stuff and that just they thought like that that's just too cumbersome that will never ever work to make it agile to make it make it a smooth process so the ideal is that when a project comes in that we help them with things like packaging software that uh, and then uh, the software could be demoed and would be like that just run Nix shell or Nix build and then just run it and then it would work. That's the ideal. So that's why we are involved. So we've been giving funds to help with things like packaging the software in the projects that are coming in through NGI Zero, and also to improve the NixOS infrastructure itself to help with the packaging as part of NGI Zero. So we've, we've, we've been giving some funds. We can uh, choose to spend them as we like, as long as they fit within these um, two categories. So then, of course, the question is, what can you do? Um, one of them is that you could send in a project. And please remember, remember that uh, it doesn't have to be about Nix or NixOS itself. It has to be about search and discovery or about privacy enhancing technologies, anything else. So the thing is that uh, if you have got a cool idea, even if it's outside of NixOS, and you think like, okay, well, you know, this is something that uh, that would benefit the world, and it's about search and discovery or privacy enhancing technology. Send in a proposal, please. So I think the next deadline is December first. So December first. So you still have, have about one and a half months. Um, packaging software is also something that you could do. There might be a few opportunities for this in the near future. Uh, we're just still looking into this, or you could help improve infrastructure there might also be a few opportunities uh, there as well so you should just come talk to us if you're interested and then how you should send in a proposal first of all keep it concise so uh, you don't need to send in a PhD thesis a few uh, things like a few pages clear deadlines clear milestones and how much per uh, per milestone that is basically what is needed and be realistic don't ask for the moon because 11.2 million euros is, is a lot of money but there's it has to be spread across many projects so just keep it uh, just be realistic split big projects into several smaller parts if you if you would want to and be patient so the proposals are first reviewed by an independent committee and then they're sent off to the EU for additional review. And so you have to think of, so one of the reviews that, that the EU will do is something like uh, looking at if you're not on a blacklist, because they actually have a blacklist where people who applied for grants but were convicted for fraud or whatever, they will simply not be able to participate. So this process takes some time. It could take some months. Uh, before you get to go ahead. So if you're thinking like, okay, well, you know, I need to, need to be starting on December 2nd, then, well, no. <laughs> then uh, you have to calculate that there will be a few months delay in there. It's just how it works. Also, get inspiration from existing projects. All of the projects that Enelnet has, uh, has funded, um, they are on their website. 
And the thing is that that is very important. Even if you're not in the EU, you can still send in, in a proposal. So what is important is that it benefits internet users in the EU. It has to be for, uh, for a better European internet. Uh, but the thing is that something that's good for the world is probably also good for Europe. So even if you're outside of Europe, you can still send in. So I could make an obliga obligatory uh, Brexit joke here. I will not do that, but even if you're in the UK, you can still send it. So some of the uh, approved projects right now. So mixed packages update from Ryan. That is, is one that was uh, approved. So he will be working on things like uh, automatically checking CVEs to see if there are updated, um, so if, the, if there are updates to packages and then automatically try to integrate it. Spectrum from Alyssa, so she's working on that as well. So that also got some, uh, got some funding. And of course you just saw Samuel's talk about mobile NixOS. But of course that's not the only stuff. So some uh, examples of some other uh, projects. One, uh, one that I am personally very excited about is Be Trusted from uh, Andrew Wong. Some of you might know as Bunny, so he's making a uh, protected hardware device for uh, protected matters. That's what he what, so something like some sort of sleeve for your mobile phone where you can store passwords, and then your phone actually has to access that device to get access to private things. So all those evil apps are it cannot get access to your private data, and that's something that personally I think is super super cool. Another one that I have not looked at, but which Jos said is super cool, is uh, VerifPal, which is about verifying security of cryptographic protocols. Maybe you want to talk about that for a few seconds. Yeah. Okay. Hello. Um, so my name is Jos van Uh I actually work for Analnet. So if you have any questions afterwards uh, about this uh, process, uh, just come to me. I'm here uh, until Sunday. So. Happy to talk to, to anything uh, about anything, but this uh, VerifPal project, uh, yeah. So, cryptographic protocols, of course, it's very important. We are financing this project uh, under the guise of privacy because if something is not safe, you cannot protect your privacy. And what VerifPal is is uh, it's a simpler way than some than uh, of verifying protocols than what uh, academics are using right now. It's very hard to. Uh, prove that the protocol is secure and what the author of Verifpel has done he has he has created a infrastructure a software project that uh, that makes it much easier to to verify this and on top of that he even used our financing to hire a, uh, a manga company uh, to write a manual which is a, a completely in manga style so if you look up Verifpel uh, project, you uh, you can have some nice nice uh, nice uh, manga reading and learn something about uh, security. So I'm not sure what kind of uh, comic book style we should use for NixOS. <laughs> so and then also uh, another project, the Discourse Activity Pub, so you can have a, a distributed things thing with likes according to uh, to Jos. But that's, of course, not the only way you can actually get funding. So there are many, many other opportunities to get open source development funding, including things like tax cuts, uh, tax cuts and grants. And a lot of people that I talk to, they actually don't know that these opportunities exist. So I just want to highlight a few of them. So in the Netherlands, uh, companies can actually get an income tax cut for innovative work. So it's called WBSO. I will not. Uh, say it in Dutch because most of you would not even understand it. But basically, um, if you're a freelancer or a sole trader or a one person company, whatever you want to call it, uh, or you're a limited company, you can basically apply for this and have a, a tax offset for your income tax, which is very, very useful. So uh, I actually use that for my own company. I spend a minimum of 500 years on research and development and then I get a tax um, reduction. So, I re so my um, 
taxable income is actually lowered with the uh, with the su with the subsidy and over that part i basically don't pay any income tax which easily saves me a few thousand euro per year which is nice um, this is actually quite common for companies to do in the netherlands there are just a whole industry built around these subsidies so it's sometimes it might feel feel like it's unethical but i'm just thinking about i'm taking back my tax money to do good stuff with it instead of some companies who are that was just built around getting subsidies and then just, you know, lining their own pockets, which is very often what happens. So I'm just, this is a good thing. So um, then there's also starting companies that can get an even higher tax cut. So if you're thinking like, okay, you know, I've, I have a Dutch company. Uh, I want to free up some of my personnel's time to actually work in open source software. You have a, a research proposal, you send it in, you at least you get a tax cut and you basically you can deliver something to the world which is beneficial to a lot of people which is nice so if you're of course if you're kind of evil and you're doing things like patents or selling licenses to IP then in certain uh, so also in the Netherlands you can get a very big tax cut on some taxes so instead of 25% you only pay 7% so that's what the big companies are using by selling their IP. So of course I'm hoping that none of you are actually thinking about applying for patents and then licensing to them to other people, but that's another discussion we can have. But I, I'm using this to illustrate that there is a lot of stuff out there that can be used by companies and that, that actually is being used by companies. And most open source people don't know anything about it and that's a wasted opportunity. So in Sweden, there is also an inno innovation agency that you can um, also talk to about research grants called Innova. So I know a few people who have done that successfully and they're also using it to do open source stuff. It's very useful. In uh, the Netherlands, there's the ISDN fund. So that's the, uh, the domain registr uh, registry that has their own fund to work on um, programs to improve the internet so you can also apply for something between 10,000 and 75,000 euro for a grant if you're doing something good for the internet so in germany you can go to the kmu innovative which is something from one of the uh, federal ministries so you can actually apply there as well they have a research and development program and there's things like the prototype fund these are all open to research and development or open innovation. So in your country, there are most likely opportunities as well. So I haven't even looked at things like, uh, like Spain, but I'm pretty sure there's, there's uh, something li uh, like that there as well. In Italy, there should be in France as well. Um, but it really pays off to do some research into this if you would just want to have someone to pay you for doing open uh, source software development with a uh, or open source research so if you're in this situation you're thinking like okay well you know I really want to work on open source stuff but I don't know where to get the money from just look into this it, it can really pay off and then basically Q&A anyone So I work for Mayflower, a medium-sized company, and I'm wondering if I want, if I have a project where I want to improve Nix, um, would it make more sense to try and do that through the company or independently? I would say that that depends on your contract with your company. So, uh, and uh, I would first talk to your boss about that because it might be that your con contract actually says that everything you do, even in your spare time, belongs to the company. Uh, that's not the case. If that's not the case, um, depends on whether or not you would be competing with your company. Mm -hmm. So uh, what, I w what I would do is just uh, first talk to your company, uh, talk to your boss, mm -hmm. and work something out. And even, even then, uh, it might be better if the company actually applies for funding. Yeah, so there's, um, but is there anything on the side of, well, N NLNet that would speak for one or the other? <laughs> 
<coughs> so um, from the side of an LNET, we accommodate both. So if you want to apply uh, as an as a individual, that's fine. And in some countries, it's good to get, easier to get tax cuts because um, as was said, if you uh, get a grant from us, basically what happens if you, you send in the plan, you fulfill what's done in the plan, and then we give you a donation. That's not taxable income, right? So that's an advantage to you. If, however, you do it with a company, then the company will have to pay taxes on your salary. So depending on that, you may, can make the evaluation what would be more beneficial. Uh, obviously, you can do it via the company if that's, if they, if that's something they, they, they would prefer. But you can do it as an individual, as a company, as a, com as a combination of a company, individual, non-for-profit. From our side, uh, anything goes. We just, when you put in a proposal, we accept it. We, we write a small uh, memorandum of understanding in which we say, when you do this, we give you a donation. And that's who, who is, who is uh, part of this MOU doesn't really matter to us. In this case, there has to be a link to the EU, but that's it. Other questions? Um, yes, can you say anything about the, um, the not, like who, who reads these? How technical can you get in a proposal? Um, do you need to dress up certain, certain things? Or well, so Jos is actually reading those proposals, so I'm just going to give the microphone back to him again. Okay. Uh, well, <coughs> our employees are, so, uh, so it can be fairly technical. I mean, I'm a Nexus user. Our, uh, we, we have, uh, you know, more than half of uh, our people are using Nexus. And of that, more than half uh, would be able to, to write a, a Nixos recipe themselves, a Nixos expression themselves. Uh, so, fairly good. Um, that doesn't mean that we know everything about all of the cryptography uh, layers, but we do have a long history uh, of uh, subsidizing uh, projects, so we mainly know not just the technical stuff, but also who are the long-time players already and we know how to look at, uh, for example, commit histories and projects, if that's something you want to reference. That's something that we can easily understand, even if we don't know the particular library you're talking about. We can very easily look at your commit history somewhere and see, look, this guy wants a grant for this project and he helped start it, or since half a year he's the maintainer, or he's written this cool feature for it. Uh, that's something that we do look heavily at. I don't have so much as a question as like an addition to that. Uh, I applied with Lizard, a project to do open communication stuff. Our pro the proposals you get to send in are fairly limited in terms of words, so the amount of technical stuff you can actually squeeze in is fairly limited. Like if you want to go into details, you straight up don't have the space for that. So that makes things a bit easier. Hi, thanks for a great talk. Um, I'm curious about what's your view on collaborations? Say two individuals or two companies would like to make a proposal together. Is that something that you've done before or how's the process around that? We do that all the time, yeah. Um, but what we do uh, often prefer, if, if a collaboration is fine, if you can split it up so that you have independent projects that have independent deliverables, that's something we always prefer because it makes it easier that uh, if one, one part of the possible collaboration finishes early, we can al already finish off that uh, administratively. Uh, whereas if you're in a collaboration, you depend on that everybody finishes to get, uh, to, to, to wrap up the project. But yeah, of course, we, we, we very much encourage, encourage collaborations, and we also encourage that uh, when you apply, you look at the proposals we funded in the past, because then you have a, a, an idea of the, the uh, sort of the, the type of projects uh, that, that we do. 
um, actually, uh, it actually goes from very low in the stack to very high. That's something uh, that the bandwidth, which wasn't yet very much uh, emphasized, but we have supported hardware, actually routing hardware, but we have also, we also support end user applications, right? So it can, it can be very wide. Thank you. Um, I have a question. So this this hasn't been addressed. So um, I'm curious, like, well, with regards of the funding itself. Um, okay, you can get tax cuts. That's great. But um, what's a reasonable expectation for the funds? Like, um, can you can you get like industry standard rates, or is it ex like how how does how does that evaluate in the proposal? Can so you, how I do you explain the the so, of course, uh, if you're a highly paid consultant uh, asking something like 200 euro per hour, forget it. That's, that's no, n I don't think that the EU will uh, actually say that that's okay. So, no, um, industry standard rates, that's not going to fly. But I think that what would be a reasonable bar ballpark figure? As you saw in the presentation, currently we have allocated uh, 4 million for 120 projects. Yeah, I mean, th okay, that, that's, that still depends on how many people and for how long, so, yeah. yeah most of the projects are single in individuals. Uh -huh. um, but, yeah, if, if you would like to go with, with an hourly rate, then it's, uh, the hourly rate is not, it's not consultant, uh, consultant level. Uh, it also depends where you're living. Basically, you are, in your proposal, you, you determine what your hourly rate will be. We just give a donation if we think it's worthwhile. All right. So, make an educated guess. All right. Thanks. But I, I, I can give you, I can give you a few hints uh, after this talk. <laughs> Sorry, just wanted to hook into the same thing, maybe to just simplify the question a little bit. I, I guess the main question is, is it something where you can say? Um, I want to have a project on which I want to work full time for a year, for example, of which you can like pay living costs, for example, right? Is, is that the kind of target? Or would it be something where you say, no, usually when people want to do a long term project like a year, it would have to be a side project next to your normal work, for example. Th I think that is the kind of thing that uh, is the most interesting thing about no, that. I, so I think there's actually both. That some people are doing it as a side project for just a few thousand. And I think that some are, some people are there asking for a bigger grant. So, so I think that the maximum you can ask is <laughs> for uh, a really good first time proposal. We have given out like fifty thousand, so that should cover your expenses for a long time. Um, but we've also uh, there was uh, one proposal, for example, he uh, was a really great project uh, to uh, ex extend an existing project with uh, activity pub support. And activity pub is a standard uh, to sort of build a decentralized social network where everybody just likes each other via uh, messages on their own website. And I'm not sure if it was the one that was extending this course, but it was a great great project which we liked. So we wanted to fund it. And at that point, the, the guy who was gonna do it got accepted into the solid team of Tim Berners-Lee. And obviously he went for that, but he said, I still want to do that. Can I do it in the weekends and then ask for, le um, well, much less, obviously. Uh, and we were so happy that he was still committed to doing the stuff that he uh, wanted to do before that we accepted it. So you can do it both. You can combine something which you want to do in your spare time or maybe reduce your uh, number of hours a week a bit and in that time work for uh, an LNET project or uh, try to uh, do it full time. So I think there are no more questions because the microphone has been taken away. <laughs> so if there are any, any other questions that you just want to ask us, so both Jos and I will be here for, the, uh, for at least uh, today and tomorrow, and Jos will also be here on, on Sunday, I will not be. So just to come up to us, ask questions, we would be more than happy to answer them. All right, thank you.